Many of you know we've been discussing this vision sermon series. Last week, do y'all know what we discussed? Anybody? Yes? All right. Well, let me kind of recap on that. You know that we exist to connect, to develop, and to advance. Our mission is this. It's to connect with others, develop our spiritual relationship with God, and to advance his kingdom to our community and around the world. So we discussed the first idea of what this looks like to not advance. That's next week. We discussed the idea to connect. Y'all remember that? Yeah, raise your hand if you remember that. To connect on how it's important for you to connect with those around you. It's important for you to connect with God. It's a twofold strategy. Not only do we want you to build friendships in the house, because we do. Not only do we want you to bring your friends from the outside community into the church, because we do. But we also desire for you to connect with Lord Jesus Christ. Because that is what will inspire you to what we're talking about tonight. If we don't have a love for God, we can never move forward as a church on mission. Now, mission and method are two different things, something that you need to be aware of. This isn't in my notes, but I think it's important for you to know. Mission is what the church is called to do. It's why we exist Grace exists to connect, to develop, to advance. It is the essence of what God is calling us to do. Method is a little bit different. Method is how we actually accomplish that vision. Something that we always should know, the the mission doesn't change. The mission stays constant from the days of the apostles all the way until the day when I'm 80 years old. It doesn't change. We're called to love God, to love others to advance his kingdom around the world. That's what we're called to do. But church, as you move forward throughout the course of history, will look different. Now, the Western culture, the church that you're used to, kind of looks like this. We come in on Sunday, we wear nice clothes, we sit down, we worship God, we have some announcements, we talk about offering, and then we have a message, sometimes an altar call, sometimes we don't, then we all go our merry separate way. Okay, that is one way of doing it. That is called a method. That is not the church's mission. We don't exist to have a service, although it's how we accomplish some of that mission sometimes. We exist to love God, to love others, and to make disciples. But if you go overseas, church might look a little bit different. They might be gathering in a basement, having a little Bible study. They might be eating together and then talking about the scripture they might only have one piece of paper that has a scripture on it. I don't know what it's like over there. I've never been over there. But what I do know is church looks different all around the world wherever you go. So it begs the question, what is the church? Is it a building? No. Nope. We've covered that a ton in our lifetime. It's not a building. It's not the four walls. It's not what happens down there. It's not just a Sunday more than gathering. The church is the bodies of believers connecting together and developing a spiritual relationship with God. In order to develop a spiritual relationship with God, what do we need first? A love for God. We have to have a love for God so that we can begin to develop the spiritual being inside of our life. Now, you do have your physical body. You can see that. You can see that I'm balding on the top. You can see that I have a scar on my nose. You can see that my teeth are a little bit crooked, but that doesn't mean that's who I am. You can see what I do on the outside. You can see that I'm a pastor. You can see that I like to play sports. You can see that I like to drink unsweet tea. You can see that, but that's not who I am. That's just what I do. Who I am is greater than that. It is the spiritual being on the inside. It is the, the thing that drives me forward. It's, it's the soul of who I am. My spiritual being of who I am. That's, that's who I am. God, God calls me his son. I don't take that lightly. If I know that I'm God's son, no matter what anyone else says about me, I'm still at peace because I know the one who created me called, his, called me his very own, and I am made in his likeness and his image. So I don't have to worry about that. 
I know who I am. I know what my identity is in. And you're going to learn more about that on Sunday. But because not only are we a, a physical being, but we're a spiritual being, we need to take steps to develop that spiritual man. If I only feed my physical body worldly things, I will have a weak spiritual essence about me, right? If I never study the scripture, if I never go to church, if I never worship God, if I never enter into worship, if I can never connect with him, I will have a weak spiritual self. And so when the winds come, when the rain comes, when the storm comes, when the hurricane comes, my faith will waver. But if I build that spiritual man, if I build him on the rock, like what we talked about last week, if Jesus is my platform and I develop that, whatever comes, I know I can handle. Let's look at this idea of develop, developing, development. What does that mean? You start from one place and over time you work and you get better and better and better, right? That's what developing means, right? So last night, sitting on the couch, and I'm trying to watch a Tom Brady documentary. It's not on. I don't know why it was supposed to be on, but it wasn't on. So we're like, well, there goes Tuesday night. What are we going to do now? So you know what happens when things like that happens. You pull out your little handy-dandy little computer, also known as your cell phone, also known as your mobile device, also known as the interwebs on the line. I got on the line. I love saying that. And I went to YouTube, right? I just opened up that app and I'm like, okay, what's on YouTube? My wife, she turns on the TV to a different thing. She goes to Disney Plus, starts watching some little creative baking show because girls like that, right? Girls like that. So I just start tuning into YouTube, watch some sports clips, blah, 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 blah. And then I stumble upon something that I found extremely interesting. It was an average dude trying to discover if he could complete an NFL pass. Now, I know for some of you, you're like, why would you watch that? I don't know. It was 25 minutes long, but it was good. So here's this average guy. He's not athletic at all, really, in my opinion. And he starts working with a trainer to see if he can actually complete an NFL-style pass. And it's really interesting to watch the beginning. First, the coach said, hey, I just want to see what you can do. Before I coach you up, before I give you techniques, mechanics, I just want to see what you can do. So the guy steps back, kind of awkwardly throws a ball. Not a spiral, none of that. It's okay. It's not the worst I've ever seen, but it certainly wasn't the best. From that building block, the coach began to say, if you just do this a little bit different, if you just work your feet here, if you just twist at the right time, if you just have the proper grip, you can begin to develop the proper technique. So, so he listens to the coach. He immediately applies that information. And the next thing you know, he's actually throwing pretty good. So he ramps up their drills. He gives them some new drills, some footwork drills, some, some balance drills, some proper step techniques. And the next thing you know, he's taking a three-step drop and delivering the ball down the field. It's getting better. Then he learns how to roll out. He learns how to run one way, flip his hips, throw the opposite way. And believe it or not, the guy actually developed. Now, it wasn't Tom Brady. It wasn't Russell Wilson. It wasn't um, Patrick Mahomes. But, but the guy did okay. He completed 50% of his NFL passes and Considering he was a brand new beginner, that wasn't half bad. Why do I bring that up? Because it's easy to start off in that infant stage not being able to do much. But yet, if you listen to the proper teaching, if you work on the proper teaching, if you apply the proper teaching, if you continue to go back to the proper teaching, guess what? You can develop. You do it in band. You do it in your math classes. You do it on the football fields, you do it wherever you go. You, it's a process. You don't start at a certain place. You work up to that place. As you learn, you develop. So do me a favor. Never, ever, 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 ever stop learning. Spiritually speaking, of course, though, 
continue growing in your relationship with Christ. You have to start with that love, but then every day you apply this teaching. You learn about him. In all honesty, we want you to grow in your relationship with Christ. When you come on a Wednesday night, we want you to grow in your relationship with Christ. We want you to take advantage of this moment. When you go to church on a Sunday morning, we want you to grow. But the thing I've realized is we can't make you do it. That's a choice you have to determine for yourself. You can hear the gospel teaching, but it's up to you to apply it. You can hear the difference between right and wrong, but it's up to you to do it. You can hear that you need to love Christ, but it's up to you to do it. Tonight, I want to draw your attention to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. So pull out your cell phones, folks. Pull up you version. I talked about this last week. If you don't have the Bible on your phone by now, what are you doing with your life, right? The scripture's right here. Just right here. It's so easy. You can look at that while you're waiting on your class to start. You can look at that while you're waiting on your parents to pick you up from school. You can commune with God anytime you want to because it's right here on your phone. I actually have my text right here, Ephesians chapter 4, 16 through 11. Check this out. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service. I could stop there. A lot of people think that it's the pastor's responsibility by himself to go into the world and make disciples. It's not what this is saying. The pastors, the teachers are there to equip you for works of service. You know what that tells me? It's up to you to do the works of service. We can talk about it. We can encourage you to do it. We could try to motivate you to do it, but it's up to you to do it. Verse 13. Actually, let's just start over. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. We don't want a weak bride to present to Christ. We want strong, spiritual, committed followers who will follow after Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. How many of us boys are mature in the house tonight? Raise your hand. I understand. Attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Let's continue on. Then we will no longer be infants. How many of you are babies in the house tonight and cry when you don't get what you want? Tossed back and forth by waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. That's important, guys. Why? Why is that important? Because the waves will come. The winds will come. The false teachers will come. You need to know what's right and what's wrong. Verse 15, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. For him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. That is a powerful piece of scripture. And I think it discusses what this development process looks like and why it's important. We always speak on spiritual development. Why? Because we desire each and every one of you in here tonight to be mature in your relationship with Christ, to actually know what the Bible is, to actually know what the Bible means, and to know what it looks like in your life. Why? Because the media is coming, not all about doom and gloom from the media, but you see it in Hollywood. They teach things. Teachers sometimes teach things, but even more than all those, even more than all the outside things that could teach against the word of Christ. Why do I want you to know this in particular? Because you never know if a pastor is speaking the truth or speaking lies. I need you to know that. Some pastors are in it for the right reasons because they love God, because they want to follow God, because they desire to chase after God, and they desire to lead his people to them. But that is not every case. 
So you need to know the difference. You need to know the difference. You need to know those who are passionately committed to God and those that are just doing it for the power. You need to know the difference, okay? You need to know the difference. How do you know the difference? If you're mature in your faith. Paul is explaining that Christ gave you gifts to help you. He gave you teachers, apostles, pastors. You heard the list. Prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. He gave you these to help aid you in your spiritual formation. I've realized this, that we're all a little bit different. A pastor's a little bit different than an apostle. An apostle's a little bit different than a prophet. A prophet's a little bit different than an evangelist. We all have a role to play in help shaping your spirituality, but we all kind of attack it in different ways. A pastor kind of attacks it in love. An evangelist might tell you exactly what you're doing wrong and say you're going to hell if you don't change. We have different wording different hearts, but yet the goal is the same, for you to focus and fix your eyes on Christ, the perfecter of your faith, and to look to him for your spiritual maturity instead of just what the next latest and greatest teacher says. We want to point you to Christ. And if we do our part, if we follow Christ's lead, if I as a pastor follow Christ's lead, I can help you in your reaching maturity. But more than anything... You need to help yourself. You need to get at home alone with God to look at that Bible, to look at that scripture and to grow. And then people like me are going to come alongside you and help push you in the right direction. That's what a pastor does. Why do I say this? Why is it important? Why do we need to reach spiritual maturity? Because life is coming. Life's not always perfect. I've experienced some really good things in life, and I've experienced some really challenging and heartbreaking situations in life. You know that. I've seen the, the mountaintops, married, having a kid. I've seen the valleys, both of my parents passing away. I've gotten the job. Sometimes I didn't get the job. I passed the class. Sometimes I barely passed the class. I know what the peaks and the valleys feel like, and if I'm not properly grounded during those moments, it's easy to say, you know what? This is too hard. I quit. Here's, here's my church card. I'm done. Got cussed out today. I'm done. But that ain't right. That ain't right, is it? No. We know bad can happen. We also know good can happen. And we know more than anything that we need Christ to get through all of it until we can reach the end of our race when Christ will say, well done, good and faithful servant, you may enter into the kingdom of God. We must reach spiritual maturity. I like this piece of scripture verse because it alludes to that of infants. Many of you know Eleanor used to be an infant, right? She didn't come out as a four-year-old. No, she came out as a little baby. And she was a cute little baby. A precious little baby. I would hold her in my arms. I'd watch the Patriots when Tom Brady played for the Patriots. And it was sweet moments. But she couldn't feed herself. She couldn't change her own diaper. She couldn't walk. She couldn't talk. She couldn't communicate perfectly what she needed when she needed it. No, why? Anyone have a guess? She's an infant. But it's funny how four years later, this girl can run, this girl can kick a soccer ball, this girl can feed herself, this girl can actually go to the bathroom all by herself without the help of mom and dad, this girl can, can write her ABCs, this girl's special development, that's why. She started as an infant when we really had to hold her by the hand and take her but now, over time, she gets better and better and better and stronger and more independent. And she has not arrived because she's got a long journey ahead. But she's better than she used to be. I think we can learn a lot from that. We might not be perfect. Anyone say they're not perfect tonight? We might make mistakes. We might fall. We might say some bad words, do some wrong things. But... We're better than we used to be. Why? Spiritual development is taking place. Your relationship with God is growing, and it needs to continue to grow. 
No matter where your belief system is, your spiritual life must continue to grow. That's one of my major points tonight. No matter where you're at on your journey with Christ, what I do know, you can grow further. And you should grow further. If you look around the room, we're all going to be on different aspects of our journey with Christ. Some may be at the beginning. Some may be like five years into it. Some may have grown up in the church all your life, and you know these stories. But you can always take another step forward. You can always grow in your relationship with God. Philippians 1.6 says this, And I am sure of this, that, who, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. Who's this talking about? God did a good work in us. But you're not done. You're not complete. You're not perfect just the way you are. As much as your parents tell you, we make mistakes. But by the end of it, God will make sure what the good work he started will come to completion. You might not be completely snow white 100% of the time, pure. But Christ is helping you get to that final destination. Don't get me wrong. When Christ saves you, he instantaneously makes you holy. That wasn't something you did. That's something he did for you. But yet, sanctification is progressive. It's a work in progress. Day by day, you chip away and you chip away and chip away until you find yourself firmly grounded on solid ground. We need a spiritual platform that is found in Jesus, is found in his biblical teaching. We want you to believe. We can teach you. We can help you. We can show you. We can model, but we can't make you believe. It's a choice you make on your own. We need to determine who the false teachers and who the real ones are. Certain things you need to be weary of. Watch out what everybody else is telling you. Listen to what the Bible is telling you. Check pro false prophets. Check prophets in general. Does what they say line up with Scripture? Same with pastors. Are what they teaching, does that line up with Scripture? Watch out. Know the difference. Become spiritually mature. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. And you're going to know this. And I'm actually going to talk about this a little bit more last week. And when I say it, you're going to be like, what? That verse? You chose that verse tonight? How does that relate to all this development talk? Well, let me share it with you. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that an advanced message? Well, yes, but kind of. But all of it. Okay, it's all of it. It is the mission of God. We all know we need to go. We're going to talk about that more next week. We all know we need to go. But there was a word in there that is of utmost importance. And it starts with a D. You probably heard me say it. It says disciples. Make disciples of all nations. Make disciples of all nations. Disciples. We got to make disciples. What does that look like? It means you take someone from where they were, you help them so that they can become spiritually mature. That's development, folks. That's what development looks like. Discipleship is for all of us, and we have a part to play in it. That's my point. Discipleship is for you. It's for me. It's for all of us. And we have a part to play in it. Right now, what you need is true discipleship, proper discipleship, a, a growth track, a development track to grow in your spiritual walk. You know what strong, mature, spiritual believers do? They duplicate. They take themselves, not necessarily their personality, their, their, the way they comb their hair, the way they speak, not necessarily that, but the belief, the belief in God, the belief in the Scripture, the study of the Scripture. They take that, they share it with others. Why? So that others can grow in their spiritual walk. That's discipleship. Right now, you are learning, you're growing, you are being discipled. When you walk out of here, Strong, spiritually mature believers replicate themselves, they duplicate themselves, and they teach what they know to others. Often we read a scripture like this with the idea we need to go, but we get the second part confused. We say, oh yeah, we need to go. We need to, we need to get other people to believe in God. We need to make converts. We need people all around the world to know him. And yes, that's true. 
but you're not finished there. When someone comes into a relationship with Christ, then the discipleship, the hard stuff begins. It's the holding their hands, the walking through the highs and the lows of life. That is discipleship. It's the teaching, the studying of Scripture, the growing. That is what discipleship looks like. We are to baptize. We are to advance the message forward. But we need rich discipleship when we do it. We can't just say, oh, great, you're saved. Perfect. See you later. That's not good. We need the rich core discipleship. Proverbs 22, verse 6. You're going to really like this one. Train up a child in the way they should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. I know you don't have kids right now, so you're like, how does that work? Well, uh, you're not a child, but you are a teenager, meaning you're not an adult. You're a minor. So if we can teach you about Christ right now, when you're old, you won't depart from it. Why? Because you've been discipled, you know the truth, and you have grown in your faith. Proverbs 27, 17 says this. This is important with discipleship making. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Talking about connection last week, how we are to grow together, grow with God. If we take that a step forward, when iron sharpens iron, we share our knowledge, we share our expertise, we share our experiences, we share what we have learned. And that helps to create more spiritual believers, more spiritual accountability. We need to grow in a relationship with Christ. It's our responsibility to grow ourselves, and it's also our responsibility to help others grow in the process. Development. So what does this look like in a student ministry context as we get ready to close? We believe your development as a Christian is of utmost importance. I want to take you on trips. I want to go play volleyball. I want to take you on mission trips. I want you to go to youth camp. I want you to be a part of fine arts. I want you to go to fall retreat. Yes. But why do we do that? Because of your spiritual development. We want you to grow in relationship with Christ. If when you graduate and you have to go off to college and you still believe in God, that's a win in my book. That's why I do this right now. When you become 40 years old and you got an eight-year-old, a five-year-old, and a three-year-old, and you still believe in Christ, youth ministry worked. Your parents helping you in your faith, that worked. That's the desire. That's what we want to see happen. That's the atmosphere that we want to foster. But I know this, and y'all check this out. You can be discipled if you're here. If you're not here, you can't be discipled. If you don't go on the trips, hard to be discipled. If you don't go to youth camp and experience those rich spiritual encounters, going to be hard to be discipled. If you don't go on those mission trips and learn to share the message forward, you will never really know how to do it. If you don't go and attend a Wednesday night service or a Sunday morning service, you're not going to know. How do you spiritually develop? You got to be there to experience it. And then you got to choose it. It's one thing to show up. It's another thing to enter in. It's one thing to appear, make a present, say, hey, hey, I'm here. Look at my new shirt. It's another thing to say, you know what? I'm about this. I want this. I want to worship God. I want to respond in the altar time. I want to receive prayer. I want to pray. It's hard to be discipled if you're not here, but if you are here, you got to make the choice. The only way to grow was to invest personally, personally, your relationship with God on your own. The only way to grow is to do that personally, but yet also corporately. We need to do it on our own. We need to do it together. We need to do it for ourselves. We also need iron to sharpen iron. We also want you to go to our camps, our trips, our retreats. Those give you a real chance to grow because it sees, allows you to see God on a whole new level. Wednesday nights are great. Youth camps are just different, you know. Conventions are just different. We try to put on atmospheres like that, and I, I think we do a good job of that, but it's different here than it is there. You need, to, you need both. You just need both. We also want you to develop your giftings. 
I firmly believe this. Yes, God created pastors, teachers, evangelists, apostles, all that. But he also created you. And you help make up the church. You're a part of the church. You're not the church of tomorrow. You're the church of today. And you have giftings, something God has given you uniquely. And you need to use that to glorify him. Like Logan, playing on the drums. Does a great job. He's here every Wednesday at 6 o'clock. Many times he doesn't come alone. Many times his friends come with him. But you, you know what? He is here. He is committed. He is using his gifts to glorify God. That's special, guys. And that's what we want you to have the opportunity to do as well. Like Joel, every fourth Sunday, he's all on the camera, zooming in, getting good shots, saying, hey, check this out, online audience, because that's growing. We got a ton of views this past week. That's important. Joel's a part of that. And that's just two examples. I know y'all all do cool stuff, so way to go, guys. I bring that up because I want you to know this. You're a part of us. And there's a role for you to play. I don't know what it is. You might. I don't. But we want to put you to work now so that when you're 50, the church is still yours, you know? You're, the church is yours now. The church is yours when you go to college. The church is yours when you're 30 years old. It's, it's for you. It's also for your buddies. But, yeah, we want to use you to develop those talents and those gifts to make disciples. We could use your help. That's why we want you on these teams. That's why we want you to serve on our media. That's why we want you to make biblical TikTok videos and post it all over your accounts. That's why we want you to make Insta reels of you explaining the biblical text. That's why we want you to be greeters and worship leaders. That's why we want you to join Fine Arts so that you can develop your, ki- your gifts to glorify God, to build you up spiritually, and so that you can build others up at the same time. So I close with this as Brie makes her way to the stage. You know, I look at my own life. I'm not as young as what I used to be. I started youth ministry in uh, 2012. It's 2022 now. So that's like 10 years of youth ministry for me. That's a long time. And I probably have another, you know, 30 years of church ministry left in my lifetime. And, and that's, that's still a long way. That's like... I double my lifetime. But I've realized this. When I'm done, who's coming after me? Who's coming after me? Did I make disciples that we raised up so that they could come behind us and carry that mantle forward? Who's going to carry the torch when I'm done? Who's going to carry the torch when Pastor Jamie hangs it up? Who's going to carry the torch when Devin retires? I know it seems like we're young, but life goes fast, guys. It goes super fast. What will their church look like then? You're the church of today. Of course you are. I believe that. I also know you're the church of tomorrow, too. You're the church of today. You can play a vital part today. But you're the leaders of tomorrow. How will you lead? If you're going to lead well, you've got to know your stuff. If you're going to follow after God and lead people to God, you got to know the scripture. Right, JC? If you're going to teach about God, you must hear God's voice. And when he says, hey, Dustin, speak on Ephesians, that's what you do. And you don't question it, you go with it. We're running this race, and we're trying to run it to the best of our ability. We want to succeed. We want to d- connect. We want to develop. We want to advance the gospel message. We're trying. But when we're done trying, when we have finished our race, who's going to say, it's my turn. Give me that baton. Let's run with it. You follow us. Whether you like it or not, whether you agree with the way we dress or not, whether you like the way we sound or not, whether you like our haircuts or our social media presence, whatever the case may be, like it or not, you are going to receive the baton when we're finished to lead. Will you spiritually be strong enough to do that? That's a hard question to answer right now. But what I do know is in order for that to happen, you start now. You develop now. You learn the scripture now. You fall in love with God now. You grow your giftings now. You learn how to lead 
now so that when it is your turn, you're ready for it. I want you to be ready for it, but I can't make you do it. you got to choose it. Thank you for joining us today. We are glad you're here. Do us a favor, be sure to like our video, subscribe to our channel, and turn on your notifications to receive more from Grace Community. Have a great week.